Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been, and, 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 and welcome to everybody who's watching us online as well. Very good to have you here. It has been uh, so wonderful to, to be here with you for this convention. And of course, we're not done yet. And um, as many of you know, uh, I am not a Freemason myself. I am a, a friend of Masonry, a lover of Masonry and the Masonic tradition. And given the reception that I have received here uh, this weekend, um, I may very well in the future be a Mason if I prove worthy. And you. The, the quality of what you're doing here at this convention uh, demonstrates and frames something that I've said for a long time and that I think really bears reiterating in this room. Uh, masonry produces such an extraordinary crop of esoteric scholars and historians from within its own ranks. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, based on everything I've seen traveling the country these past several years, um, lockdown permitting, I would say that there's probably no other uh, private or spiritual organization in modern life that has produced such quality in terms of writing, scholarship, and historicism from within its own organization and ranks. And that is uniquely important because I often say that if you do not write your own history, it gets written for you. And it may get written for you by people who have no understanding of the values that emanate from within your ideas. And that is what motivated me to write my first book, Occult America, in 2009. We simply cannot allow the esoteric tradition in the West uh, to wither for lack of understanding, for lack of proper contextualization. It's just too important because Freemasonry as an organization and, and this is another uh, uh, of its distinctive features, I would say, uh, in terms of how it interacts with the outer world. Freemasonry as an organization has done more, I think, than any other private group in history to ensure the protection of the individual search for meaning. That is something that you enshrine within your lodges, and that should always be remembered. It's vitally important despite all the divisions that we have in our country today, and they are profoundly serious, and none of us know what the end point of all these divisions is going to be. But I've often felt that as long as the individual spiritual search is protected, we will make it. We will not founder. Our civilization will, will function and we will get through. And masonry has played a uniquely important role in the sanctity and the preservation and the protection of the individual search for meaning. It's important, critically important to the larger civilization. And that is another of masonry's accomplishments. Uh, we are this evening going to watch this documentary, The Kabbalion, that I was very privileged to work on. And this documentary, as many of you know, is based on a classic 1908 occult text uh, that was written by a man named William Walker Atkinson, who used the pseudonym Three Initiates. Atkinson, uh, in the early 20th century, ran a magnificent esoteric publishing house called the Yogi Publication Society uh, from the uh, Masonic building, uh, an Art Deco skyscraper in the city of Chicago. And Atkinson was a, more than a prolific writer. Uh, he wrote under many different pseudonyms. Three Initiates has probably proven his most enduring and his most popular, but he also used the names Yogi Ramasharka, um, Theron Q. Dumont, and my personal favorite, Magus Incognito. <laughs> and, and I must say, this, this good man, who was, a, who was a lawyer, who was an aficionado of, of new thought and the new metaphysics that were sweeping through the Western world at the time and have become 
so deeply a part of the firmament of American spiritual life today. Um, he was someone who exposed a lot of people to ideas of an esoteric nature that they might not have had other opportunities to come upon. You know, he probably wrote something on the order of 17 books under the name of Yogi Ramasharka alone. And some people will look back and say, well, you know, that was, that was ersatz Vedism. That was kind of novelty yoga. It wasn't the real thing. It wasn't the real deal. And there are some truth to that criticism, but it's also true that this enterprising man exposed a lot of people to Vedic and yogic ideas, uh, which would not really explode across the American scene until probably by the time of the late 60s, the Woodstock generation and so forth and so on, when the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, for example, first came to the United States in 1959 to, treat, to teach transcendental meditation, an authentic teaching from the Vedic tradition, a lot of people were able to receive and understand uh, what the Maharishi and, and other figures who followed him were teaching. They were able to contextualize it, thanks to figures like Atkinson. Now, making the Kabayan film was really a dream come true for me. And yet it was an unlikely dream come true, because the fact is, uh, perhaps as with some of you in this room, when I first discovered the book, maybe about 15 years ago, I all but wrote it off. I didn't take it very seriously. I thought, well, you know, this is a, a novelty of early 20th century occultism uh, by a guy who kind of draped certain hermetic ideas and certain new thought ideas, which he married together in Egyptian garb. And I thought, sure, there's a drama to it. Um, there's a certain mystery to it that he cultivated by using a byline like three initiates. So for, you know, the internet had to be invented so we could all debate who were the three initiates, you know, and so forth. Although documentary evidence makes it pretty clear that it was, it was Atkinson and, and Atkinson exclusively. He had claimed the copyright and he uh, identified himself as the sole author in a early edition of Who's Who in America. And there are other pointers that demonstrate that Atkinson needed no help at all to turn out dozens and dozens of books, many of surprisingly high quality. And yet I had a hard time wrapping my mind around the value of this book. And I tended again, you know, to think that it was a kind of act of costumery. He was taking this late ancient philosophy of hermeticism, which at that time was available in very, very few quality English translations. He was adapting the work of some other occult writers, and he had a profound interest himself in new thought philosophy or the philosophy of mind causation. And he was putting this out into the world as a kind of act of drama. And uh, around that time, I was talking to a scholar of religious studies, a very well-known man, but it was a private conversation. And I mentioned to him my misgivings about the book. And he got a little gleam in his eye and he said to me, you know, there are some good ideas in that little book. And that haunted me, that haunted me. And I thought perhaps I was a little too quick to describe myself, think of myself as somehow too serious for the Kabbalion. It's not real hermeticism. I want the real thing. And I suspended that judgment. I suspended that judgment. And for one summer, uh, I read it five times in a row, which may or may not make you want to go on vacation with me, but this was my, <laughs> this was my beach reading. Um, <laughs> And I read it five times consecutively, and maybe because I was just ready to receive it at that point, maybe because my own studies in Hermeticism had gone a little further at that point. And I'll tell you something, um, what was it? Alexander Pope said, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The more you get to know, the less seriously you take yourself. And maybe, maybe because my own Hermetic studies had deepened at that point, I was able to stop and realize that 
Atkinson had done a pretty remarkable job of mining, selecting, cultivating some of the psycho-spiritual ideas from the Hermetic tradition. And I suspect, I suspect that he was probably relying uh, in part, he had several sources, but I suspect he was probably relying on a, a translation that appeared two years before the book in 1906, uh, written by a wonderful scholar named G.R.S. Mead, who produced a three volume set called Thrice Greatest Hermes, making a reference to Hermes Trismegistus, the Greek appellation for the Egyptian god of intellect, Thoth. Now, who was G.R.S. Mead? Well, he had been a secretary to the world traveler and the occult philosopher, Madam H.P. Blavatsky. And again, Madame Blavatsky is a figure who's controversial. People will make these detracting remarks about her all the time. If you go on Wikipedia, you wouldn't realize why on earth should I be interested in this woman or her work? Well, she did many wonderful and extraordinary things. One of them was she served as a kind of patron, a source of encouragement to GRS Mead. And he produced in, in his translation of the Hermetic literature, one of the first truly, truly serviceable English translations of Hermetic literature that has come down to us. And it wasn't until two generations later, around 1992, when a very, very wonderful scholar and philosopher named Brian Copenhaver produced a work called Hermetica through Cambridge University Press, which I think really surpasses the work of Mead, but stands on Mead's shoulders. So it's so important, it's so important that we not get bound up in this kind of airsat seriousness. So, oh, you know, a guy who uses funny bylines like three initiates, he can't hold anything for a serious seeker or Madam H.P. Blavatsky, all the weird stories that circulate around her. Well, it was her secretary, G.R.S. Mead, who produced a translation that at least made these ideas serviceable and useful and available to English-speaking people and gave birth to works like the Kabbalion, which ultimately deepened my own study. I have to say, you know, at this point in my search, I take religious novelty very seriously. I think a lot of people embark on very significant personal journeys thanks to what might be called novelty. And we see this everywhere, and we see this all the time. And I say this with deepest respect. When the Catholic Church, for example, beatifies new saints, they are creating a kind of doorway through which contemporary people can enter into certain ideas. It represents, in my opinion, a furtherance, a possibility, an open door. We see this all the time. We see people who might begin their studies uh, with ideas or figures that maybe don't have ancient or scholarly vintage, but nonetheless, a door gets opened. A door gets opened. And once you open a door, you never really know where it's going to go. I've often asked myself, why did so many centuries have to pass until we had serviceable English translations and interpretations of the Hermetic literature? Now, the Hermetic literature, as will be alluded briefly in the movie, was a literature that grew out of ancient Greece's uh, encounter with ancient Egypt in the latter stages of ancient Egyptian civilization. Uh, after Alexander the Great, uh, the pharaonic system in Egypt was discontinued and Egyptian rulers were very frequently referred to as Ptolemies, which was basically a term for general or military uh, commander. Um, Alexander's armies conquered uh, ancient Egypt and in some regards, in some regards, the ensuing centuries resulted in a kind of decay or a kind of breakdown of Egypt's religious system until the reign of Cleopatra, 
about uh, 50 years before the birth of Christ. Now, again, Cleopatra is one of these names that we hear all the time. There are movies, there are plays, there are operas, there are video games, there are stickers. You know, who, who was Cleopatra? Well, she was a very real person. She was an Egyptian ruler of Greek descent um, by the time of her reign, and really to a very great degree following um, the armies of Alexander, uh, ancient Egypt was ruled over by a Greek administrative class. And members of this Greek administrative class, depending on who was in charge at a given time, they were, they were Philo Egyptians. They admired Egyptian culture, they loved Egyptian culture, but they were not uh, Egyptian themselves. And sometimes they had a very, very distant uh, relationship um, to the subjects and the millions of people who made up Egyptian civilization. Cleopatra was different. She was different. She was more than just Philo Egyptian. She really cared about and wanted to revive Egypt's esoteric tradition. And she did so primarily from the cultural and economic seat of the city of Alexandria. And in the generations uh, immediately following the death of Christ, there were Greek speaking uh, scribes, part of this administrative class uh, living in the city of Alexandria. And they hit upon a revolutionary idea and a very simple idea, which was that they began to write down a Greek um, Egyptian esoteric tradition into the Greek language. And this was enormously significant because of course, uh, Egypt had its own language of hieroglyphs, but it was a symbolic language. It was a characterologically based language. It, 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 didn't, it didn't have the expository qualities that we as Westerners have become accustomed to. But along come these Greek scribes walking in the tradition of Cleopatra, and they begin to write down teachings that until that time had appeared either exclusively in hieroglyphs or were passed on through oral tradition, which was, of course, very, very common in antiquity. Most of our religious and philosophical ideas, of course, began as oral tradition and later got written down by figures who we call Homer or Socrates or Pythagoras, but we know very, very little about the personhood of these figures. And it was common in the ancient world that scribes, I wouldn't really call them writers, I would call them scribes, would affix the name of a venerated figure to their writings in order to lend gravity uh, to this work. In fact, it's really a modern innovation that an author has an individual identity of his or her own in antiquity, in Egypt, in the Mediterranean, in the biblical lands, in Hindustan, in, in, in ancient India, in the Far East, in China, in Japan. It was very, very common that a writer was really a scribe who was speaking on behalf of a government or an army or an empire or some kind of royal court. And we don't know if any of these figures actually existed. We don't really know who, who Lao Tzu was, the author of the Tao Te Ching. We don't really know who Sun Tzu was, the author of the art of war. We don't really know who Homer was. These were names of individuals or groups of people that got affixed to things. And this literature that I'm describing was very often attributed to the figure of Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus, which was a title of honor, an appellation of honor that these, these Greco-Egyptians gave to the Egyptian god of writing and intellect, Thoth, who they thought was three times greater than their own god of intellect, Hermes. Hence, they called him thrice greatest Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. So that's how this literature came to bear the name Hermetic. It was signed by Hermes or Hermes Trismegistus. 
And it contained a philosophical core. There were many, many different hermetic tracts. Some were uh, magical in nature. Some were oriented toward very specific spells or alchemical operations. And some were philosophical in nature. And the philosophy found in the hermetic literature basically, basically can be put this way, that all of creation emanates from one great higher mind, which the Greeks called nous. And this higher mind creates through the figment of thought, and creation appears in these various concentric circles of reality. And humanity, us, appears in one of these concentric circles. And one work of hermetic literature, which probably was written in very late antiquity, is known as the Emerald Tablet. It was first translated into English by Sir Isaac Newton. And there appears the famous dictum, as above, so below, as above, so below, which I think is a parallel to the scriptural precept, God created man in his own image, as above, so below. And one of the ideals found within the philosophical Hermetica is that as we were created by some great, vast intellect, some infinite intellect, infinite mind, nous, so can we create within our own sphere of existence. And this is where the hermetic literature, I think, is so deeply important for contemporary seekers. I mentioned that William Walker Atkinson was very deeply interested in the new metaphysics that was sweeping through the Western world in the late 19th, early 20th century, which can loosely be called new thought. And the ideal of new thought, it's a kind of extreme idealism, is that Mind creates all. Mind is responsible for all. The individual is a kind of capillary of some cosmic force. And this metaphysics has become vastly popular throughout the Western world. And yet it can also be profoundly frustrating because I think many of of us who are on the path, certainly speaking for myself, look at this literature And we feel instinctively there's truth here. There's innate truth here, but it doesn't, it just doesn't account for all the complexities of life. It doesn't, it doesn't account for suffering. It doesn't account for disease. It doesn't account for all the mass problems that we see spread throughout the world. And it's insufficient in my view to fix a philosophy by borrowing from another and saying, well, you know, it's karma or it's race consciousness or it's this or it's that, you know, I think sometimes we have to stand bare in front of something and say, there's something here in this philosophy, truthful as it is, valuable as it is, that's not fully working. And I think the hermetic literature can provide a unique help and insight in this regard, because one of the ideals in the hermetic literature, and you'll find this represented in the Kabbalion, and that's one of the reasons why I really began to turn my head uh, with respect to my attitude about this book. One of the ideals that you'll find in the hermetic literature re-expressed in the Kabbalion is that yes, the mind is a creative force. Yes, the mind is a causative force. But we, human beings, are not the only game in town. We're not the only thing going on within cosmic reality. We have to function within the cosmic framework that we live in and the physical limitations that it visits upon us, including mortality itself, including decline. These bodies that we live in physically are going to decay and decline. And there is suffering and there is tragedy in our world. And I often say, it may be true, it may be true that mind is the ultimate arbiter of reality, but we live 
we experience, we experience many different laws and forces. These are facts of our lives. And I think that for the new metaphysics, for mind metaphysics, for new thought, for these variations that sometimes get called by names like law of attraction or manifesting or power of positive thinking, for those philosophies to really grow up, we need to take account of the fact that while they have wonderful truth, so I believe, they do not take account of the fact that we experience many different laws and forces, including physical forces, geography, seismic shifts, tidal waves, hurricanes, famines, volcanoes, not to mention warfare and all the horrible inhumanities that we inflict upon one another, sometimes as a result of these other forces. We don't have to throw away the idea that the mind is causative. But what we do have to do, I believe, is nurture the maturation of that idea. And that's where the hermetic literature can be a unique and decisive help to us, including in some of its popularizations like the Kabbalion. Now, let me return to the question that I presented a little bit earlier, which is, Wow, if we have this supposed time capsule of ideas from ancient Egypt written in an expository language like Greek, which was later translated into Latin during the Renaissance, a language that we in the West have access to, why is it not more widely read? Why are there not more serviceable translations? Why did we pass across centuries and centuries and centuries without better translations that would make these ideas accessible to the Western seeker? Because the Hermetic literature got rediscovered during the Renaissance around the year 1460, and it was translated from Greek into Latin, which Latin at the time was, of course, the language that was used by um, educated people um, people who were part of the ruling structure uh, in Europe at that time. Well, I think things started to get uh, derailed at the end of the Renaissance, uh, just more or less on the eve of uh, the Thirty Years' War, that devastating, devastating conflict that swept across Central Europe starting in 1618. Um, the reason that the Hermetic literature fell into disrepute, more or less, is that a textual analysis uh, by a linguist named Isaac Casabon in the early uh, 1600s uh, determined that the Hermetic literature had been written in late antiquity, in the generations following Christ, a, a point that I made earlier. This was very, very deflating to many educated people during the Renaissance. There was a hope among Renaissance seekers, translators, clerics, people who had charge of culture, people in royal courts. There was a, there was a principle, there was a hope that somewhere out there in the distant past, there existed this pristine primeval theology something that was older than everything else, older than Christianity, older than Judaism. And that if we could get down to discovering this primeval, pristine theology, we could discover the workings of the universe. And there was a hope in 1460 when a Byzantine era monk entered the court of the Florentine ruler, Cosimo de' Medici, with these Greek manuscripts, which later came to be called the Hermetica or the Corpus Hermeticum. There was a hope that with this discovery, this pristine theology had been uncovered. It had been found. And there was a belief among cultured people in the Renaissance that the figure of Hermes Trismegistus was perhaps a real figure, a psychopomp, a man god. And that this figure of Hermes Trismegistus 
perhaps was contemporaneous to Abraham or Moses, maybe was the teacher of Abraham or Moses, maybe was someone with whom Moses had studied when he was in Egypt. This was the hope. And when Kazaban's textual analysis had decisively proven that the Hermetic literature dated to late antiquity, after Christ, rather than deepest antiquity, over time, over several generations, those hopes were dashed. And a viewpoint settled over the Western cultural scene in the dawning age of enlightenment. And the viewpoint was that because the original hopes of this literature's age had been dashed, there was something compromised, fraudulent, corrupt about the material itself. This was a huge, huge mistake in the development of the Western mind. It, is, it, it grew out of a malady of human nature, which is that we engage in this kind of either or thinking, take it or leave it thinking, black and white thinking, binary thinking. Well, because the hermetic literature, so the reasoning eventually went, because the hermetic literature isn't as old as we had hoped, that means that it's compromised, it's sullied, it's fraudulent. And as the Age of Enlightenment proceeded, it was forgotten. It was written off. It was, it was, it was at times even made fun of. If you read Mary Shelley's wonderful, wonderful novel, Frankenstein, she has characters in the book. This wasn't her point of view. This wasn't her point of view. But she has characters in the book who were running down the hermetic literature, telling the figure, the tragic figure of Victor Frankenstein, don't read that stuff. That's a bunch of carnival nonsense for uneducated masses. That's a bunch of junk. You know, that was the point of view that developed. And because of this, I think, really blind thinking, this take it or leave it thinking, the hermetic literature was neglected for centuries. Isn't it wild that it was only in 1992 when Copenhaver's translation was published, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. That was really the first serviceable translation that came down to us. It's hard to believe. There had been other translations. They had greater and lesser qualities to them. But for example, the translation I mentioned by G.R.S. Mead, you can easily find it online. If you read it, you'll see it's written in a kind of very heavy, leaden, Victorian language that almost mimics the language of the King James Bible. I think he was doing that perhaps because it was just a literary convention of the day. And the idea was that if it sounds like scripture, it must be really important. And it was a literary device. He was a great, great man and a great, great scholar, but I don't think he produced a translation that was accurate to the original, which also made it easy to write off. But William Walker Atkinson, the author of the Kabbalion, did not write it off. And he made the effort of plowing through this very thick, turgid translation and mining gems from it, which he combined with his own interest in new thought metaphysics. So we lost centuries of progress on the path because of this, this human malady of black and white thinking, of binary thinking. Now, the hermetic literature I would say it's less controversial today than it was, say, in the 1980s. In the 1980s, there were a lot of scholars who said, oh, that stuff, you know, that's just warmed over Neoplatonism. They treated the Hermetic literature a lot like I had once treated the Kabbalion. They said, oh, this is just you know, late ancient Greek thought dressed up in Egyptian costume. It's not really serious. But in fact, in fact, as we've learned more and more, and as we've uncovered other texts of really deep antiquity from Egypt, we find correspondences between the Hermetic literature and very, very deeply ancient Egyptian esoteric thought. What's more, what's more, and this is again another malady of human nature, just because you put a certain date on something doesn't mean it started then. Can we dig that? <laughs> doesn't mean it started then. 
the story of humanity is a story of oral tradition. You maintain an oral tradition uh, within Freemasonry. You don't just invite in, you know, Mike or Tom and say, well, you know, this is what we're all about. You know, folks, you know, here are the mysteries, here are the secrets. Do you like it? You know, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. You value your ideas. Your ideas are precious. You labor, you labor to come into an understanding of these ideas. This has been part of the human story. And of course, it makes perfect sense. When a kid is born, when a baby is born, it possesses, that child possesses only sound. That child can cry to indicate, well, I'm hungry, or there's something wrong, or there's something I don't like, or what have you. And eventually, that child develops motor skills and motion. Eventually, that child develops speech. And it's only later that speech becomes writing. You know, what else is writing but an approximation of speech? It's nothing else. It's nothing else. So the development of the human individual mirrors the development of human history. And it's a fact that many of our religious traditions began as an oral tradition, whether it's scripture or whether it's the work of Homer or whether it's the teachings of Pythagoras, many of which were not written down until centuries after Pythagoras died. Why would it be any different for Egyptian antiquity? So the Hermetic literature, in fact, is, I think, a very, very deeply valuable time capsule to a very, very distant ancient past to which we have, I would say, a frayed thread of connection. That thread has gotten broken. That thread, that thread has gotten intermingled with other things. That thread has gotten discontinued, but it is there. It may not be orderly, but it is there. And so it's really extraordinary to me that in our search today, in our search today, the ancients still have help to provide us. I don't think that's putting it in too dramatic a way. The ancients still have help to provide us. In our generation, we have the first truly serviceable English translations of the Hermetic literature. I've mentioned Copenhaver, but there's another translator, Clement Salomon, who with a team of co-translators published a wonderful translation of the Hermetica several years ago that's published by Inner Traditions. And there are other works out there that stand up very, very well. So this material has become available to us in ways that it was not to previous generations. And it's happening right now, right now. That's profoundly exciting. And so I really honor the work of a man like William Walker Atkinson, who, yes, he used his dramatic bylines. Yes, he uses dramatic and occasionally strained, exaggerating language, all true. But the fact is, he did do the work of plowing the field, of plowing the field to try to find certain ideas that are there. And it's the wrong question to say, is it or isn't it real hermeticism? Well, based on everything I've just described to you, hermeticism has always been a philosophy that's been patchwork, that's been controversial, that's been neglected. It's, it's only really within the past few decades that people would even pose the question, is something real hermeticism? Because a generation ago, we didn't often even think in terms of there being a, a real hermeticism. This literature was written off largely, and it was preserved by a small handful of esoteric seekers who had the instinct, which has been proven correct by time, that there was something there. There was something of great, deep value there. And the book, The Kabbalion, was written based upon that instinct. And the documentary that we were privileged to make uh, honors uh, that instinct and uh, attempts to marry that instinct to certain current innovations and ideas and practices. And more important than anything else, more important than 
anything else, and I'll, I hope you'll, you'll hold this in mind as we watch the film in just a few minutes, is that we're not, we're not alone on this path. We're not alone on this path. We have the group. We have one another. We have Freemasonry and the system of preservation and practice that it has safeguarded, it has vouchsafed, and we do have voices of the ancients to help us on our way. And I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.